No, they're just technology. Um, it's just easier. I don't, well, I don't know. think about it. Think about three months ago. What did you think about Zoom? I wasn't much better on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love this. All right. We're going. All right. So if we have people joining us on Facebook, welcome to the uh, Bible study, the Wednesday night Bible study. I call it the Allen Park, but there's an awful lot of people from all over the place that Adios. watch this and participate. And so this is all for the glory of the kingdom. So um, before we get going, how about we pray? <laughs> Heavenly God, we ask you to send out your Holy Spirit so that as we talk about uh, the creeds of the church, that they may be speaking truth to us. And Lord, that we may be able to use them to teach ourselves and others what it means to be loved by you. Lord, let us never get uh, caught up in legalities. Let's uh, not get caught up in arguing about the finer points of theology. But Lord, let us know that when you opened yourself to us through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that you were declaring your love for us. And you created us in your image. So uh, Lord, as we aspire to be more faithful disciples with all that we do, we ask for the help of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. So we wanted to talk about the Apostles' Creed uh, in particular. So uh, how many of you read the preamble stuff that I got that I sent out? I had a chance to look at it. All right. Well, good. And um, so, uh, but I want to start off with um, before we jump into it, well, you know what? Maybe we should. Can you can you allow me to share my screen? I might be able to do it anyway. Oh, no, I can do it anyway. Okay. So I am going to just jump to something here. You have somebody in the waiting room. Can I admit them? Um, Karen's iPad. Yeah, it's Karen's heel back. So I, I, okay, you got it? Yeah, I got it. All right. So you guys are kind of seeing some things here, right? Pre-creed elements in the New Testament. Right. right. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to go there. So the Apostles' Creed, we're going to talk a little bit about it. We're going to talk about creeds, but I wanted to put it in front of you. And so the one that I want to uh, read with you is the one on the right-hand side that says contemporary. This is the one that... Um, we would uh, that we will recite in church on, on occasion. Um, if you go to just about any church, um, then they ask, they say that they're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. Um, this will be the version. Um, sometimes they use some old English, old English, and it you know it's just like the Lord's Prayer. It's how you taught it, how you were taught it when you were a kid is how you tend to say it because it just rolls off. So like when I learned the Apostles' Creed. You know, it was like he sitteth on the right hand of God the Father, you know, and um, so I tend to slip into that myself. But this is the contemporary version. And when I say contemporary, all it means is that it was the old English and it's been modified. So if you get a, um, and it's very interesting to walk into churches because a lot of them have uh, hymnals. The Presbyterian hymnals used to have this on the front and the back cover. One, or they had the Lord's Prayer, they had the Apostles' Creed, and they had the Nicene Creed. Can anybody remember those? So they were on the, they were on the front and the back on the on the overlay uh, overleaves. So um, let's listen here. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I'm sorry. I fell back into my old style here. The living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, um, let me I'm get back 
here so I can see some of you guys. All right. So that's the that's the creed. Um, it's the one that we use, but there's one off to the left. And I want to read that and just think about this things that are similar or perhaps different. It's called the Old Roman Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence he will come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and the life everlasting. And notice that the life everlasting is in... Um, is in parentheses. So, when do you think the old Roman creed was written? It's old, right? <laughs> I, I had uh, seen uh, some other information said maybe about the fourth century after okay. Christ. All right. Yeah, well, this, actually, this is the old Roman creed uh, is is the we that is that is really that was the first church. Now we have to understand that there was some schisms within the church in the early days. When I'm saying early, we've been talking about like um, maybe like 120, 140. So um, the Apostles' Creed, so creedal statements came into being because they were used for two things, teaching, right? They were usually things that people could memorize. And the other thing that was used was to um, resolve differences between teachings in the church. So it was generally groups of people that got together and they argued these things out and they came up with these creeds. So the Apostles' Creed is by far the oldest, is by far the oldest, um, creed that we have, the oldest creed that we have uh, being used continuously in the church, and it probably dates to about the mid, about, about 140, 150 AD, right? Now, if Jesus lived in 33, and if we assume that all the, all the apostles were dead, you know, by 100 AD, um, the lore is, is the lore is that um, um, the lore is is that the apostles wrote this. Yet we can see that there's nothing there's nothing that uh, would indicate that that's the truth. The truth. So, so it doesn't make doesn't make it any less uh, truthful. It doesn't make it any less useful. But it's helpful to know where these things come from. Now, Art, you mentioned about the mid fourth century, right? And there is more creeds, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time on those too. But I wanted, but in order to really uh, gain an appreciation for the Apostles' Creed, um, I think it really helps that um, that we understand a little bit about where it came from and why it why it's there. Um, so that's what I wanted to do a little bit today, if you don't mind. And if it doesn't sound any good, then tell me. How can I get out of this? Oh, I know why. All right, here we go. So first of all, what is a creed, right? And a creed is a statement of faith or belief. In, in, the, in the Greek language that, we, that the New Testament is written in and has been handed down in, uh, belief and faith is pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S, and it means the same thing. That reminds me of um, uh, um, Dickie Jean's granddaughter used to call me Pistor Tim. Pistor Tim, that's right. right. So <laughs> my wife, it's a little disconcerting when you're trying to teach and then your wife just bursts out in laughter alongside of you. <laughs> it's a cute story. <laughs> So uh, the statement, the statement is, it, it says, I believe. And so Latin for belief is, pre, is credo or credo. So we come up with creed. It's a statement of belief. But when we say it together, right, 
when we say it together, it's becoming, it's a group, right, declaration, which means that it's corporate. It means that we believe. Um, and we can also see that in the differences when we pick up uh, and look at some of the other creeds that developed over time, the later ones, a couple of the later ones actually say we instead of I. So um, it is the identifying marks of the church, right? It's, it's saying what the church, not only what the church believes, but what the church lives into. And it always states positive conditions of a belief. But sometimes it states negative ones, which means that states stuff that we don't believe. I want to get this out of here. I'm going to move that. There it goes. So where they come from, they're generally statements of a larger church group. When I say larger, they're probably, you know, like um, um, the earliest ones were councils, which we'll talk about. And they came from all over the Roman Empire. So the bishops of each area came and they were the ones that argued this thing out. They brought people with them. Councils would go on for a long, long time, sometimes for a couple of years, uh, trying to, to distill a common understanding. And there was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of, there was a lot of kicking people out of the church. So because when you when you finally agree on what what you believe right now if somebody insists otherwise now they're a heretic and they're kicked out of the church so um it, again most of these came up because there was disagreements about who christ was um what the trinity was so that's where that's where these things developed out of but but we can look in the new testament even in the old testament Right, we can look in the in in both of them, and we can find some elements in them that are pre-creedal. When I say pre-creedal, they're not they weren't fully developed, but um, but when we read them, uh, in the case of some of the letters of Paul, um, it he changes its cadence and it changes its writing style. It's almost like he's writing one way, and then he gets into this, and it, and it says, "Well, wait a second, this isn't how Paul writes." So we think that he's reciting something, and and that would be something that everybody would be familiar with. So it's all so he's breaking in to a creed at that point. We're going to go through some of that, but we even find it in like in Deuteronomy chapter five, right? Um, the the Shema is is you'll find this. This is a Jewish prayer that you will find um, that the the Jewish people will write it uh, in little scrolls, and then they roll the scrolls up and they'll put it over their doorways. Right, and the Shema is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul, and all your strength. Um, so that that would exist as a as a creedal statement, right? Well, we see some of this in the Gospels, and Simon uh, in Matthew, a couple of them in Matthew 16. Simon Peter answered and said, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." This is the first time that any of the disciples had identified Christ as the Son of God. So it's really important because that's one of our central tenets, our central beliefs in Christianity. Um, and uh, and you'll find, you'll see as we talk about this a little bit more, if it interests you, we'll talk about uh, that Trinity because there was a lot of arguments um, that, um, that developed out of that. Just what is the Trinity and what isn't the Trinity? Um, those, those arguments were generally made a little bit later in, uh, in 350 to 450 AD. And then also in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke on to them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and, earth, and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the world. Amen. So um, we think that since that has an amen into it, that this is something that when Matthew, Matthew was writing this, that this was already existing in the church. So we think it's very, very early. In the teaching, to go forth to all nations and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the this is the only place where that Trinity, that Trinitarian uh, 
uh, in the Gospels anyway. This is the only place in the Gospels where that is where that Trinitarian formula is seen. Um, Couple others, the Gospels. We just have these two in the Gospels, and we're going to move into Paul's letter for a couple. Of, this won't go on for a long time. Don't worry. In Mark, the Gospel of Mark, which we think is is the earliest of all the Gospels that were that were written, probably around sixty. You know, certainly within 30, twenty-five to thirty years, the death of Christ is when we think that the first um, first uh, Gospel of Mark can be dated to. And Jesus answered him, the first of all these commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, all of, their, all of thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So that first part is the Shema out of Deuteronomy that we just talked about before. And then Jesus, he was asked, he's, he was asked, what's the greatest of all the commandments, the largest, the most important one. They were trying to, uh, the Pharisees were trying to stump, stump them, get them to say that one of, one of the commandments is greater than the others, and therefore they'd have them on a charge of blasphemy. But, uh, but he answers it really smart. He says, well, the first one is this, to love God, and then the other one is to love, love your neighbor. So again, central tenets of the Christian faith. And then uh, out of the Gospel of John, I just kind of was trying to find spots, things from, I didn't find anything out of Luke for you, I'm sorry. So I have to move this. Well, I have to go by memory because I can't see it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which was born not of blood, nor of will, or of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can't see that. And we behold his glory, and we behold his glory and the glory as only the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's uh, out of the Gospel of John. Beautiful poetic language that John uses. And here, you know, he's talking about uh, the coexistence of the Trinity at the time of creation, right? He's saying Jesus was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and, and was there in the beginning with God because there, was, there would become a time um, in the church when people would say that Christ was actually created by God. So that would, that would be a problem because it would make um, not, the, peop not the, the three entities of the Trinity equal. So Paul Wolf keeps going in and out. What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe bad internet. Okay. So let's move on to a, just a couple that I want to share with you from Paul's letters. So Paul wrote an awful lot of the, the epistles. And he also, uh, so Romans is the one that the last letter that he wrote, it was relatively late in his ministry career. So we're probably talking about, oh, probably uh, 75 to 80, somewhere in there, maybe 70, as early as 70, but it, that's late in his career. So out of Romans, he says in chapter 10, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and even with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So core, core belief, right, is that we're saved through faith. So when we believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ and the resurrection, that is the delivery of uh, salvation, not through works. So, and then in, for, although we're, we're led to do works because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So 
And then he's got, there's two here from his first letter to the Corinthians. And this is the first one. But to us, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we're in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So, and in chapter 15, 3 through 4, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third, for the third day according to the scriptures. So these again are written slightly different than the than the uh, cadence of how Paul usually writes. So noting that difference, um, we can we can look at that, but also realize and it wasn't just the cadence of it; it's actually what it says that it's making um, statements about uh, the nature of the Trinity. Here's the last one. This is my favorite. Because Philippians is a wonderful letter. It's a letter of joy. Um, and this is, um, we think that not only, this is known as the Christ hymn. So we think it's not only as a creedal statement that people would have um, memorized, but it's also um, might have been put to music. So people sang it, right? So, uh, and he's talking about um, Christ and Christ giving up his um, divinity when he be when he so he is fully human fully divine but when he's on that cross and he's taking on our sin he he becomes fully human so he can completely pay the price even though he didn't have to do it so it says who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth, in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Amen. So, there we go. All right. So the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to go back to the... Stop sharing. There's everybody again. We lost somebody. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Somebody got bored. All right, so we were going to talk about uh, the Apostles' Creed. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history. And we do think that the Apostles' Creed came out of the old Roman Creed. And that being because the church in Rome was firmly established by about 100 AD. And um, we can see that that was, that was actually transcribed, written, transferred down through that, through that area. And then we can also see how it... Um, the earliest Apostles' Creed we think is about 125 or so. Our, our garbage people, our garbage men are just showing up, so it's going to get a little little loud here. So they're running late today. Um, so you know there was we can tell we can tell by Paul's letters that you know there was a there was a big difference. There was a lot of disagreement between early churches about what this Christian Christianity was. Remember, at the time of Christ, it wasn't called Christianity. It was called the Way, and it was it was uh, viewed as a um, a different way of doing Judaism by by many. So, if you've been following along in our uh, daily devotionals up until today, we were reading out of Galatians, and Galatians is Paul arguing with the church in Galatia about uh, a false belief that they've been taught by by another person that's come in called the Judaizers. So you don't have to shut that. Okay. And um, so again, Paul, Paul uses these things to come back to common teaching to say, because you know, you forget the basics sometimes. And then somebody says sweet, you know, whispers sweet nothings into your, into your ear and you kind of follow along with that. But Paul's way of dealing with that is to keep coming back to the basics. What are you saying? Remember, remember what I told you. Remember what I 
and you believed it then, why don't you believe it now? So these creeds are ways that the church can use to instruct, but also that they can uh, eliminate heresies. So before we go into the Apostles' Creed, there's basically three, three creeds. I remember this. So um, there's the Apostles' Creed, and then we have the Nicene Creed. Now, the Nicene Creed is probably around 325 AD, and because it, it came out of the Council of Nicaea. The, um, the Council of Nicaea was, um, the Council of Nicaea was called um, because uh, Constantine was tired of the church's fighting, and he wanted to use, the emperor wanted to use um, the church as a unifying uh, element across the entire Roman Empire. Remember, the Roman Empire was under a lot of stress and strain um, at this time. So he wanted to utilize that. So he just said, you know, I can't have the, I can't have all, if I, we, made, we made it into the state religion. We can't have you all fighting. I want everybody to come to Nicaea and we're gonna sit down and we're gonna settle these things. So that's where the Nicene Creed came out of. It settled a thing called the Arian uh, controversy. And the, this is what the Arian controversy was. Um, how does, how does the, what is the Trinity, right? And there were some that said, well, the Trinity is one God. That sounds all right, right? We say that, yeah, we say one God, three persons. But some people said, but it, well, there's one God, but uh, God appears in those three ways. And that's, and you, we might say, well, that sounds okay, right? But then somebody goes, well, wait a second. Um, that means that there's, that uh, the distinctness of the Trinity just means it's God appearing as a, as a modality is for wherever God is needed, that's where God appears. And that's not true. There's your cat. Your cat finally heard me. So sorry. <laughs> cat's obsessed with Tim. <laughs> so, so, uh, so they wanted to settle this. And so uh, this, was, this was one of the things that came out of the Council of Nicaea. And then, um, and then we have the uh, um, Cal uh, Chalcedon. That's right. Chalcedon was later at 451, and this was um, this was in response to some teachings that said that Christ is it got two natures, right? That human and that divine nature of Christ. So before people were saying, "Well, wait a second, how could he have paid the price for human sin if he wasn't human?" So that's where they had already identified that he was God, but then they had to get this human and divine nature. So all of these things are, are elements of um, dissension within the church. Now, the, the earliest guy gets thrown out of the church, and I just got to tell you this before we open it up, and we'll talk a little bit about the elements of the, of the specific apostles. There was a, there was a guy uh, in... Um, Alexandria, Egypt, by the name of Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N, right? Now, he looked at this, and so I, I tell you this story because we've had Bible studies, and I've heard people ask this question, so I know it's even a common thought process of people today. It's logical, which is he looks at the Old Testament, and he looks at the New Testament, and he goes, there's no way that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. So he teaches that there was, that there was a creator God, right? And then a salvic, a, a saving God, and that they're, they're not the same. Well, this created quite a quite a problem. So that was one of the reasons um, that um, that you see that the Creator and the Maker of everything. That's why that's very early into this because Marcion was at the time of about 125. That might be a clue of why the Apostles' Creed was first set down was to deal with this. And Marcion became a very uh, important person in the church. He actually um, caused the first church split. Um, and so there was, there was the Roman church, then there was the, what they called the Marcionites. And, um, and they actually held some influence for about 100 years, 150 years before they died out. And, they, and they were, their teachings were, and he also didn't like all the letters in the, he was the first one to put a canon to say that these are the books. When I say canon, it's 
that, the, that there were certain books in the New Testament and they were gonna limit their studies to those because there used to be, there was a lot more of other texts that were around. Remember, there was no publishing houses, there wasn't any printing presses. So um, every church had their handwritten copy and it was a little different. Well, he's the first one to centralize and say, well, I'm gonna take these 10 letters and these four gospels and that's it. That's, our, that's, that's all I'm gonna teach out of. Um, and it took the church about another 300 years to come to that. Come to come to that conclusion on some of the other books too. So that was pretty good. This is the last time they're coming through, I hope. Yeah, that that was my question, Tim. Is how how they? I know they didn't have books then. How they came about having what they had? So you, that's you answered that. I know they just didn't have a Bible to open up like we have. They had right. limited papers and. So they had. Um, so the way that things were, number one. Most people didn't read and write, so um, but but uh, people who were trained as clergy did. So when people came, they heard the Bible because they couldn't read it themselves, and they certainly couldn't afford one because the only way that it was they had to be hand transcribed. So there was very few, and of course, but that happened. That exists. That was the, that was actually how the world existed until the 1400s. With you mentioned the printing press, and um, so that and but that's you know that's just the way that it was is is um, is people heard the, the the scriptures rather than read them. Any other questions before we look at? I've never heard of a Mycenaean. How do you pronounce it? Chalcedon? No, it starts with an M. Marcia. Yeah, I'd never heard of that before. What, that the old God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament? No, that, that, that there was a Marcian yeah. spin-off. Oh, okay. We didn't talk much when I was in seminary. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was busy raising kids. <laughs> Mag, I didn't hear, I haven't heard that story before either, and I never heard of the Chalcedon Creed before either, so this, those are both new to me. All right, well, I don't, have them, I don't have them for you now, but if you want to do some work, when we finish up here, when we, before we get back together next week, you know, you can take a look at it. There's also the Athanasius. Um, he's kind of, Athanasius, and that was pretty late, that was actually in the 500s, that where Athanasius actually put everything together that's become the... The, the current uh, understanding of the Trinity of God um, that we that we currently use. So why don't I, I'm going to go back here to share my screen again, and I want to go to that. All right. So we have the Apostles' Creed. Let's look at the way that it's put together. I'm looking at the contemporary version. If that's okay with everyone. Um, so, but think about this. When did you learn the Apostles' Creed? Like the first thing you learn after the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary, if you're Catholic, I guess. Right. I mean, but not when you're six or seven. No. Middle school. No. Yeah. So confirmation class, yeah. page, right? Yeah. So because this isn't this isn't something that's. Um, this takes a little bit of logic and a little bit of reasoning, you know? And so um, it's usually, and it's in confirmation class, it's when people are starting to get a little bit more serious or maybe even, maybe serious is a bad word, a little bit more investigative, a little bit more curious about how this whole God thing works, right? And um, so the Apostles' Creed does pretty well. And again, now legendary, they say that there's 12, there's, there's 12 uh, points in this. So they say, well, each apostles put in one of those points. Um, we know that that's not the truth, but there are 12 points to it. So um, the first one says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. So that's making a very big, strong statement, right? And please jump in here if you have a question or a comment or would like to discuss it a little bit more. Um, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. It's saying that I believe in one God, right? Not, not 
a God, it's the God, it's I believe in God, who, who acts as Jesus told us as, as a father, right? And is all powerful. So that's an off, that's actually, it says, well, that's only a couple words there, but it says a lot. And then it continues on and it says, this is the same God of the Old Testament. It's the creator of heaven and earth. Right? So it's also saying, I believe that there is another, there, I believe that there is a heaven. That it's not just what we, what we witness and live in here. So we've already said, we've just gone through one line and we've already said an awful lot about the basis of our belief. It goes in here and it says, now again, we're talking about the Trinity and everything. It says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Wow. God's son. So expressing the divinity of Jesus Christ and our Lord and master. So that we bow down before the teachings of Christ and we obey the warrants that Christ tells us to do. Where did Christ come from? That's the next point. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. All right. Now that's taught, you know, that's taught in the Gospels. But, um, but it also says something, right? It says that this results in problems later on. Because we think as humans, right? So if we think of about paternity and all that other stuff, and so we have God and then Jesus, his son, and but would conceive by the Holy Spirit, we have to be careful because now all of a sudden we put a sense of time into this thing and we can say, well, then it was God and then God's spirit and then Christ. That's the, that's the order of creation in it. And that's not a true teaching. Right? We say that they were that uh, God has existed as the three, which uh, which is a which is a big object of of the arguments that happened in three twenty five. Born of the Virgin Mary. Go ahead. All right. When when they define Jesus, yeah, they define him as Christ. There are a lot of people who have the name Jesus, right? Not just. Jesus, the one that we are worshiping. Right. So is Jesus the man and Christ God? Is that what we're talking about when they say, I believe in Jesus Christ? Yeah, Jesus was a common name. Um, but, uh, but it was Jesus. And I really should be, I've always sometimes thought about saying it should be, we should really say Jesus, the Christ, right? The being exclusive, but well, uh, yeah, Christ, go ahead. Okay, any way we want to look at this, one part's defining a human being, and the second part is defining God. Yeah. Uh, Christ is, is, I'm assuming, I, I don't know, that's what my question is. But when I when I look at that and I see who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, I'm thinking about the man, Jesus. Right. And that the Holy Spirit, because he was in the mix with a woman, there was that Jesus. But the part that was Christ is the part that is the word. The part that is the word I'm talking about. The word, okay. The creative word. You're talking about what what John refers to in in his preamble. The word. Yeah, the word. Yes, right. Yeah. So I I mean maybe I'm I'm you know trying to take this down. I don't. I, no, you're you go keep going. Yeah, I, when, when I think about how that particular phrase goes together, uh, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the, the human part, the divine part, and the divine part was Christ, who is our Lord, and the human part was what Mary had right and the holy spirit was the one who provided the divine son right. right 
So the, um, um, I mean, I'm not advocating for them, but the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, right? They, they, they talk about that divine nature that, that the Spirit delivered, right? But you have to understand what the Spirit delivered was not originating it. It, it was just delivering a piece of divinity that had, that had been in existence from the very beginning. And, um, and then Mary, right. Mary carried into a human form. So right. we were, we're talking, we sound very Catholic right now, by the way. <laughs> So, I don't, um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so then we, but when I think about the promise that was given to Eve, it was to her and not to Adam. And the reason I think that is because that was going to be the human part. Mm -hmm. And the divine part was going to be what God was going to provide. Now, he didn't right. describe it at that time, but we're attempting to share it in this thought that we have here. Yep, and the and the word, um, the, the way that John chooses to do it is he talks about the word, and that um, um, I'm trying to remember what was that. Logos, that's it. So logos is um, the Greek for word. So if you were to read that in Greek, um, this would be a play of words. So there would be a lot of uh, alliteration, but um, it also, but when, you, when we change, when we change just a couple of the vowels in essence in logos, it uh, it becomes it, it's easy to to see it as as a divine as as God, so it was a it's a play on words, but it's also because it's God's word is Christ, right? Because he comes to he comes to to earth to teach us and to show us, and ultimately also to pay for our sin. So so the nature of it there, and so then when we get into this. Uh, Push pull. We have to be careful. We don't think of it as a push pull thing of Christ being fully human, fully divine, being that he's a, he, you know, he's um, that that it's just a perfect 50-50 match. I mean, certainly, the re the only reason why he has to be human is to pay the penalty of our sin, because only only light pays light. So. Um, but the beauty of this is the fact that it's God himself comes down and dwells with us. So if God created from up high and like the, the ancient watchmaker turned, you know, wound it up and then let it go, uh, that's a, a God that's, that's distant, right? But then now we have a God that comes down, takes on our same form and lives with us. So we can feel, feel the emotions that we have, the difficulties that we have, all of those things. Is there a question? Um, yeah, I kind of have a question. Go ahead. You're, you just said that um, the only reason Jesus was in human form was to take on our sins. Right. But wouldn't he also, could you make the argument that he also was in human form to teach us about God? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right, and that's what the prophets tried to do too. We didn't listen to them either. I, I was wrong to say it was exclusionary just because of the sin, but it was only God that could pay that, and He had to right. he, he had to be in human form in order to do that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, we're go here. Here we are talking about the sin aspect of it. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. So the, the, the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary is there because that represents the miraculous birth, right? So that was God, that was God being able to do something um, that could that, that had no explanation, right? A virgin birth. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. So this is now getting into the debt that he pays uh, for us. Pontius Pilate, of course, was the was the Roman governor. 
um, and um, was crucified, dead, and was buried. So he was crucified, died, buried. And on the third day, he rose yeah, again. Tim? Yes, go ahead. Okay, right now, because this is from my Methodist background, we always said about that he descended into hell for three days. Right. That was part of it. Why? I mean, are there different versions for different denominations? Well, I think you were probably reading the Nicene Creed. No, it was a. It was also in the Apostles' Creed. Was it really? Yeah. Yeah. But between the fact that he was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell for three three days, and on, on the, the third, third day, day he, he rose again from the. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. Right. Yeah. Right. But I mean, yeah, I'm just kind of curious why that's left out. That that well, you know. Just the contemporary nature of this one. So, um, on the third day. He crucified, dead, and buried, descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. You're right. So why was that left out of this contemporary? I mean, it's not in the old Roman creed either, really. No, I think, and I think that has something to do with it. I think they went back and played it off of the old Roman creed and said, oh, well. So it was, if it was in, it was a late addition. Um, I don't really have a great answer for you, Beth, other than that, to say the fact that there's there, there has been some, when we contemporize something doesn't necessarily mean we make it better, right? A lot of times we try to remove, um, we try to remove things that people might find objectionable, even if they're true. Yeah, I know, I understand that and stuff, but like, all right, so when was this contemporary one from? This is, this is from, this would be basically the 1990s. Okay, so maybe it was just uh, Methodists were keeping with some 1950 one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but so what happens is, so the aspect of hell is is um, something that has been discussed and talked about. Maybe there's a difference in between denominations on the you know on the feelings of it, um, but it just it's not here. It definitely isn't here. So. No, I, that's why I always kind of hesitate when I'm saying it now in church, because it's like, wait, yeah. there's the line missing. <laughs> yeah, but we don't say it in the one that we say it at Allen Park, do we? No, that's what I'm saying. Mary, what do you guys do down there in North Carolina? You do it the old way? Mary. Come on. Anyway, so, um, Yeah. Nice, good point. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right. And is seated. Sit, see, I see. Sit, sit it. <laughs> I keep saying that. And is seated at the right hand of. And it's. Uh, I always what we say is God the Father, right? But the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. So, I like the quick and the dead better. I was just gonna say that. I I remember one that said the quick and the dead. The quick and the dead. And, and so do you know what quick is? Not really. So when when um, they said that when, birth, right? well, yeah, it's when a baby flutters in your, in the, mo in, in the mother's uterus, right? What That's a heard? quick, it's a quickening. So we're said that, that when Elizabeth, right? When Elizabeth meets Mary and they're both pregnant, right? It, uh, Elizabeth feels her baby quicken, you know, it just kicks just comes to life. So I like that because it's the living and the dead. But when we say the quick, it means it's it's even the unborn, right? It's even the unborn. I, I, I like that better than, than this contemporary. So I believe in the Holy Spirit. So the third part of the Trinity. It took us a long time to get through that Christ, that, that whole second article First article is God the Father. Second article is Jesus Christ. Now we're down here in the third, right? Which is the Holy Spirit. Now the interesting thing is, is now we're into there. Now look at the listing of things that follow, right? This is all marks of the church. And it also means that it's the Holy Spirit, right? That, that, um, that allows these things to happen. So, the first one is we say the Holy Catholic Church. How many of you have said, we're not Catholic? So right. many people argue about this. <laughs> yeah. 
And what's so, supposed to be capitalized and what's not. Right. So I will say, um, you see that there's an asterisk there, but um, there, uh, this is, a, and it's an easy one to, to ask, but to answer, but it's one that every, there is, people are embarrassed. They're like, man, I'm in a, I'm in a Presbyterian or a Methodist church. Why are we saying that we're Catholic? And, um, but it's a small C, right? So what Catholic means is universal. So we are saying that regardless of our denomination, and regardless of the arguments that we might have about um, big or little things, that we are part of the church universal. So there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of uh, people that have tried to replace that with the, ca the Catholic church with the universal church. But um, there's a problem with that and the fact that it has uni in it. So that, because there, then that, that kind of negates, that kind of negates some of the Trinitarian language. So there's people that don't like that either. But if you look back over in the old Roman creed, right, it just says the Holy Church. Because back then there was only one church. So this was put together at a time and added to because to indicate that there was a knowledge that there was things. Now the church split and the earliest church, the biggest, well, Marcion I talked about, which was in, in the mid second century, but there was a fairly large uh, split, which we'll talk about next week, if you'd like to, um, about the nature of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so that caused the Eastern, what, what became the, the Orthodox Church, the, the Church of the East, to break away from the Church of the West. So, and it all, it all comes down to a thing called the Philoquy, which is really kind of interesting. Um, but that's for that's for next next week. So um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the Catholic in this thing is meaning universal. Correct. So the Holy Universal Church is what is being described there, right. and it has no denomination. That's what I was thinking. Absolutely. I don't know. Am I? Am I? Uh, it seems like we have a lot of definitions about churches, but when God is looking at us, or the Holy Spirit is looking at us, He's looking at what's inside of us, right? Not a necessarily necessarily a definition of a theory that another church doesn't agree with. I agree. There's been a lot of, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, enmity between churches, uh, between denominations. That's why we have ecumenical things. And um, we still don't get it right. We still don't get it right. So, um, but you see here that we have like the, the three articles, as I said before, the first two lines that are up there, that's about the first article of God, the Father. And then we have Jesus Christ, the Son, right? And then the Holy Spirit. So we talked about the Holy Catholic Church, but the, here's, a, here's a procession of other things that all are, all are subservient to the Holy Spirit. So we make a mistake, I think, in our, in our mainline tradition, and I think the Pentecostal church, churches get it right, is the fact that they focus in on the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy, it's through the Holy Spirit that all of these things are made known to us and experienced by us, and it's pretty significant because it's it's our it's our our community life together as believers, right? That's that's the Holy Universal Church. It's the communion of saints, and that's not just us here, but it's all of it's all the people, all the believers of all time who have passed before us. That's the communion of saints. Right, saints is just a it's a believer. Somebody professes the forgiveness of sins. Right? We say, well, wait a second. God did that, you know, in, in Christ. That's true, but it's activated in us through the Holy Spirit. Right? The resurrection of the body. Right? In that. So we're saying, when we die, I mean, I met with a family today who, um, you know, planning a a, a, a service and. And uh, the question was asked, um, 
you know, well, I asked them, I said, well, you know, what are the purposes of the funeral service? Because the person that died, died in faith, and he, they, they are in the best place they could possibly be, right? They're with the Lord. So, it, but it's us that are here, and we're, we're the ones that are struggling. We, we have this great big hole in our heart where somebody's been torn from us, and um, really the purpose of the service, I mean, we can't do anything that's going to that's going to change God's opinion of that person. That that person is either with God or they're not. Or but but what but what we need to understand is the fact that it's the opportunity is provided to all. And when we um, and and what we need to lean on, what helps us in our grief is this understanding. Once we finally come to grips with the the fact that that person is no longer with us, is that we have this hope of the resurrection. And that Christ's resu resurrection was the first fruits. It was the first one. And that we are going to follow that. And, and it's not just a resurrection into the body like zombies, but it is a resurrection into a completely new resurrected world that's eternal in nature, which is the last part of it, the life eternal. Tim, whenever they do that, do they always put the asterisk after the Catholic? No. <laughs> I, whatever I stole this one from had it in there, but it's, it's a common enough question that, um, that they, I got this from a text somewhere, a textbook. So, um, they're, they're smart. They, they knew that that's kids are going to ask that question, you know, wait a second, we're not Catholic. So, but the Catholics say this, you know, they say, they say the apostles creed. Not often. We don't say it as often as we probably should be. Um, there's some churches. So here's my next question before we finish up for the night. Not everybody was um, Presbyterian. Not everybody came from a Presbyterian background. There are some Presbyterian churches that will say a creed or a portion of a creed every single service. Has anybody ever witnessed that? We had it here at our church for a while, the last yeah, couple of years. Jim yeah. uh, did it every week, had a creed. Did he? of faith was oftentimes agreed. So we did say a lot of them. Right. And there's a lot of different creeds, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and then the we've done the question and answer one. Um, we used to do that a long time ago where they made it a question and answer. What do we believe? We believe, you know, have you ever seen that one? Well, that's the, Heidel, the Heidelberg. Uh, no, yeah. the, no, the Apostles Creed, but put into a question and answer. Oh, no. No, no. So it's something that I, you know, it's it, when you're when we're trying to arrange worship, and then you know we're saying always well, like we got this, and so that well, that's not a that's not an element that we have to do. But I do we do tend to try to put it in uh, on the high, on the high holidays, you know, Christmas and Easter and things like that, some sort of statement of belief. Well, if we're not singing hymns, we maybe need to put some in. <laughs> yeah, but you know, here's what I can't figure out. So we're not, I mean, we have the two hymns, right? And, and, um, but we don't have the choir. We don't have, we don't have a lot of stuff in the service, but it's still taking us an hour to do it. Don't, don't make us answer this. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start timing you, Tim. I guess it's me. I guess it's me. <laughs> Maybe you're just efficient and you want church to go its regular hour. But I do, I do. I yeah, you're right. I, to I think a but, but we've got a, we have a children's sermon now. So correct. And I think you do spend, you know, it's not wrong at all because that's what we need right now, but you spend more time like at the beginning announcements and talking about things. Yes. Than what you know, I mean, I think that's where some of the hours coming in from. Yes. Yeah. It's not my long winded. Long -winded I don't look at my sermon. watch, so don't worry. Oh, we're going to start timing now, Tim. <laughs> it's all right. Works well. Never so look this at is my the watch. first one. This is the Apostles' Creed. It is the most simple of all the creeds. When I say simple, it's the least complex. Not that it's simple and because it means an awful lot. So the Nicene Creed, which follows this about 250 years afterwards, um, maybe even. 300 years afterwards, um, if you know that that goes into a lot more, 
And then there's other creeds that do it. And there's actually creeds that the, Pres the Presbyterian church is a creedal church, which means that uh, we have um, in our, in our constitution, we actually have the book of confessions. And so we have confessions that we feel are churches that are speaking out on the action of God in a specific time and place and purpose in the world. And um, so we have included those and we argue and, uh, and debate whether one should go in there. So we have, we just put the ball for about two years ago, I think the two, yeah, two years ago, we put the ball for um, in, which is um, South Africa, the churches of South Africa coming to the realization of the systematic racism in South Africa and the impact that it had on that society and on the people. So um, if you want to look that up if you want to. It's not a huge one. And, and read that in, 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 um, in comparison to what we're seeing nowadays right here in our own country. And I'll tell you here, here's an, here's an interesting thing. Meg, Meg and I were over in South Africa um, on our way through to Botswana to see our son Josh. But we did we did we were did spend uh, about a day and a half in Johannesburg, and we actually went to um, the apartheid museum. So apartheid was the official governmental separation of of uh, whites and blacks, and um, so we're walking through this apartheid museum, and it says the origins of apartheid, um, which were basically in the nineteen. 40, right after World War II was when it really became. And um, although it wasn't hard to do because the white people owned all the land by then anyway, but um, it says that they went, they, they sent delegations to the United States to see how to effectively uh, put segregation in place. Isn't that something else? Wow. And something else. I mean, I, I read that and I'm like, no way. And then I, oh, <laughs> you know, wow. So yeah, so so these so these creedal statements, um, there are a lot more than just the trend. These early ones are, are arguing about the nature of God and the Trinity, right? But then later ones start to get into how does God act in the world and how does how are we to react to that? And so, you know, a lot of that means is that people when they stand together. And this is the difference is when they stand together and they profess something together, it unites them, right? So this is, this is one of the great purposes of, of reciting creeds together. And I had a question. Yeah. On the line, when he comes to judge the living and the dead. Yes. So are they saying, you're dead, you're dead, and you're not going to get judged until the kingdom comes, and then somehow you're risen up, and then you're going to be judged, or everybody gets a free pass when they die, and then they get weeded out later? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, when it says dead, I think it's referring to people who have passed on already. So not, not that their souls haven't passed, but that they'll still be this, uh, this was written at a time, and you remember that the, the Catholic Church used to um, talk about, um, oh, um, where was it the souls went? And then uh, purgatory. Purgatory, thank you. <laughs> purgatory. So that, that, so that there was a, you know, it wasn't, now they're not wrong. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that that, that exists, but, but we know that when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, Right, that it's not it's not something that the true kingdom doesn't occur until heaven and earth are merged into one. That becomes the kingdom. So there is a there is heaven, right, where people are, where souls exist, and, and we do that. But this the kingdom of God, this final this final thing isn't going to happen until Christ comes again, and then heaven and earth are merged, right, into a new into a new thing. I think we miss that when we read Revelation sometimes, is that it's very clear that it's not like we're just moving from this place to heaven, that there's actually a reclamation of God's creation, the earth and all that's on it, and up into the kingdom of God. So 
something to look forward to. But I think in this case, um, Joan, that when, when it says dead, it was people that have passed from this world. So there, there will be a judgment. We know that. I mean, there, there, Revelation is pretty clear. It's one judgment. Um, and, and Paul, and, and not Paul, um, Jesus talks about it in Matthew, the, the sheep and the goats, you know. And, uh, so you're going to get judged when you die. You're not going to get judged twice. Judged when, twice. When he comes again, he's not going to judge those that have already died. He's, he's, it says he's coming to judge the living and the dead. Right. The people who have died. So their souls, you know. So it's the judgment. What, don't look at it this way. The judgment day, right, is when God says, yep, world's ready. The world's ready for this, for, to, to, for the kingdom. So I don't view it. You can look at it as an individual judgment and say, well, does that mean that some people aren't going to make it? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we read it and, and see that there's some people who have um, been exposed to it and have willingly turned their backs on it, right? And, and it's pretty clear, it's pretty clear in what Jesus teaches is that, you know, there's, that, that's, uh, he talks about burning, you know, burning in the fires. And sometimes it says it's better for you to burn in a fire than to have, than to face that judgment. But it's also not talking about um, that we need to, this was John Calvin's problem. He walked around constantly terrified, constantly terrified that he was not going to be uh, saved. And, um, you know, we don't need to do that. We, we can go about with confidence in the fact that this is what's been told to us. We do our best, right? And then we constantly evaluate ourselves. And then when we realize that we fall short, we just, we, you know, we make amends. We, we, uh, we ask for forgiveness and it's given. So it's not, it's not an accumulation of the good that we did on earth that results in the judgment. It's, it's where our heart is, where our heart was. Doesn't doesn't the Holy Spirit um, regularly come towards us? At least my perception, anyways, it comes towards us, reaching out towards us when we're faltering. At least that's what I think I see in my own life. So, you know, it isn't like it's just if, if I don't get there, you know, uh, to that point, but he will reveal something to me to help me move in that direction to change or, you know, have an attitude change in my heart. I don't, I don't know exactly what the words might be best. A transformative you know huh? it's transformative because we come we come from people that live for ourselves right because our, our decision making if we didn't believe right our decision making would be that we're just going to make decisions that benefit us or or maybe our family right but we're not going to care about the people next door and and um so when we, this is where it comes from that if we go around and we worry constantly about our salvation, right? We've missed the boat because salvation, you know, our personal salvation is already guaranteed. It's assured by what Jesus did. What we have to do is make sure that we're prepared for it. And then we have, and then we do that through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will transform us into beings that we can never be, you know, and we all of a sudden are concerned for the others. Uh, is bigger is bigger than that. It's seeing something. It's seeing something coming down, and running towards the danger to help others, rather than away from it. So, and that's a hard thing to do. You know, it's like, um, I mean, I can say that I've I've done that on several occasions, and I'm like afterwards, I'm like, what did I do? That was crazy. You know. But it's like, you know, it's I, I, you see somebody getting into a problem, you, you just, you go to help, you go to help. And that, and that's completely opposite if we were just into ourselves of what we would do. Now, that's an extreme example, you know, but 
but it, it extends to everything. It extends to helping our neighbors. It's like, I mean, we have, the windows are open. We have a single woman, a mom that, that moved in next to us, uh, divorced and um, she just, she has no capability to take care of any of her stuff, you know? So, so I'm a yard boy now. <laughs> so, and I laugh about it, but I mean, it's just something that, I mean, I know that she doesn't have it. And she keeps saying, oh, well, you know, I'm gonna give you some money. And I'm like, no, I don't want it, you know. She, she's barely making it as it is and she's a mom. So I've got the world's smallest yard. It doesn't take me more to do two poaches in stamps than it does to do one. You know, so, but, you know, that's just, I'm giving that as an example, not holding myself up as perfect, but I can say that 20 years ago, I don't think I would have ever done that. I probably would have said, I don't think, you know, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, 30 years ago 20 years ago, she married, she, she married a better guy, you know, yeah. So I think that's what the Holy Spirit does are, is, is that it, it takes us to places that we would never go. Uh, it strengthens us, right? It, it guides us, um, but it also gives us this feeling of confidence, you know, that we, not, that we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry. Yeah, but how, how do you get measured if, if, I mean, there's Mother Teresa. Right. Okay, and there's me. <laughs> you can't measure up and, and using your example you run to help somebody what if i'm standing there and it's burning and i'm just plain afraid so i'm not going so i still believe so yes you do you but do. but so i remember i remember being at a presbytery meeting when they were examining somebody for uh, they were examining somebody to be a minister right it was their final examination so there's a lot of questions that get asked and so this one one person stands up and asks this this um it was a it was a young woman um so um are you are you prepared to die for the gospel that was the question, right? Are you prepared to die for the gospel? And she looks and she gets this quizzical look and she says, well, not today. <laughs> you know? and I'm like, wait a second, where's this going? I don't know. That'd be, I mean, it was an unfair question, but, you know, and then she goes, but, you know, if it was the day, I'm sure that the Holy Spirit would give me the strength and give me the, give me the ability to do that. We don't all need to be Mother Teresa's. The world only needs a couple Mother Teresa's. What the world needs, though, is the is the bulk of people caring for each other, right? And um, and and living their lives not just for themselves, but for but for the common good too. So there's that's why the, that's why sainthood. I believe in sainthood. I really do. I mean, the Catholic concept of saints, because I think that there's some people that have just had been tremendously touched and anointed and gifted. And um, and that um, you know mir miracles do occur, and that um, those people had a real inside track on the Holy Spirit in their lives. I think we keep losing people, so we must be must be day twenty. I have a, I have a question. You you raise sainthood. Do you have to be? Um, ordained, you know, as a minister or a deacon, or not even a deacon, but do you have to be an ordained person to become a saint? In the Catholic Church? We don't have saints. In, 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 yeah. You know, I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I don't, I don't know any of them that weren't priests yes. or, or nuns. Yeah, I don't they, think you had to be an ordained priest for that. No. no? Well, didn't make Joan of Arc a saint. She wasn't a. Okay. That's yeah, true. There you go. Did you know that there's a saint from Detroit? The priest. The priest. Yeah. I watched Detroit Public TV. That's the best, by the way. <laughs> we 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 were in a place in Homer. We had we had a Grand Rapids. No, wait a second. Lansing. 
And Grand Valley. And Grand Valley. Those were the two public TV stations, and they couldn't hold a candle to Detroit Public TV. So. All right. Any other questions? You guys want to do this next week and 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 take a jump over into into the other to the Nicene Creed? Yes. Sure. Yes. Why not? Yep. So sure. Uh, I, Thank you very much for doing this. No problem. No problem. I wish I wish I had all the answers, right? But then I, but I don't. <laughs> so so what we can do, um, and then. Um, Here's an interesting thing. Has anybody ever heard the phrase, an iota of a difference? Yeah. Right? So next week, we're going to find out what that means. <laughs> All right? I'll, leave, a I'll, leave, I'll leave you with that one. <laughs> so, an iota of a difference. So I said, well, you know, it's a little tiny. But actually, it actually has a, it has a basis in church history. So. All right. Let's pray. Lord, uh, what, what a wonderful time that you've made for us. And we thank you so much. It's at the end of the day. And sometimes uh, we get a little weary, but when we uh, read your word, we're strengthened. We're given uh, visions. And Lord, we pray for that time when uh, both the old and the young will prophesy about you, about salvation, about the coming kingdom. And Lord, uh, just let us give us the confidence that we know that we're worthy and that we need not worry about uh, whether we will make it or not. But what the question is, is, Lord, how much will we believe and how much will we rely on our belief? So, uh, Lord, we thank you for the, the, the wonderful and gifted people that were uh, that joined here and we've been able to discuss these things. Lord, lead us further into your word to a better understanding with you. And because, Lord, when uh, when we do, when things get difficult, well, then we lean on you even stronger. And that's exactly what you ask us to do. So we ask all of this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank Thanks, you. Tim. All right. Good night. Thank Good you. See you all. Thank you again. You're welcome. No problem. <laughs> see you soon. All right. All right.